There's a Buddhist precept that says, loosely translated, that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And I have had many, many great teachers in my life, which either means that I've been very ready or I have a lot to learn. <laughs> I think it's probably the latter, but I'd like to talk to you today about one of those teachers and three of the precepts he's offered me that really has inspired me through my whole career, but I actually didn't remember it until just last March. This particular teacher, his name is James Thornton, and James died last March, and I drove the 10 hours from here to Ohio to visit him in hospice before he passed. And when I got there, he, he had stopped eating, and he was essentially in a, in a coma, um, had gone through the roughest part of that process and was very quiet. And I got into the room, and there was no family or friends there, which was very unusual because this is a man who was loved wildly. And there was a hospice worker in the room, and she was going through her seed catalogs. It was March, and it's Ohio, and she's thinking about spring and planting. And James was in the bed, and I sat down, and, and she looked at her catalogs for a while, and she finally said, well, how did you know him? And I explained that we had together put uh, a theater company together in Kent, Ohio, a small college community called the Kent Acting and Touring Company. And that we had done some of the most exciting work of my life by doing environmental theater. We did a Christmas Carol in an old mansion. We did Dracula in an old house. And the audience would come in and sit down. And they were surrounded in a total experience. We did bus stop in a 1950s uh, shelter that we turned into a 1950s bus stop. Later, he became a teacher. And he hired me also to be a teacher in a high school. And we really were able to shape new ways of teaching young people about the theater and to be theater artists. His incredible ability was to look at a 14-year-old and see the great person that they could become. And he certainly did that for me. She said, how did you meet him? And I remembered I was 14. And it was a memory that was so far gone. I was in catechism, which for those of you who don't know, for Catholics is Sunday school on Thursday evening. Makes no sense. And James's company at that point was doing in the sanctuary God spell. And I wasn't part of the company yet. And I didn't understand this idea of an environmental theater. But I could hear them rehearsing. And when it came to the lessons of catechism and the lessons of God's spell, I was pulled to the sanctuary. And I raised my hand and said that I had to use the bathroom, which was not the first time I would lie in church. <laughs> and they excused me, and I snuck in the back of the sanctuary, and I watched this incredible man direct. And he directed in a way that I had never seen, which is he was using the actors and their ideas, and they were collaborating and creating together. Eventually, the stage manager, all dressed in black, with one leg significantly shorter than the other, came up to me and she put her finger right in my face and said, this rehearsal's closed. You have to leave. And, and so I, 14, did. But as I sat in catechism, I thought, I, I can't stand it. I have to be where this incredible thing is happening. And, and that feeling actually has gotten me thrown out of hundreds of rehearsals over the years. <laughs> But this particular time, I raised my hand again and said I had to use the bathroom again. And I'm sure the teacher was on to me. But off I went. And I went under the pews, sort of G.I. Joe style. And I crawled up to the front so I could see what was going on. And that lasted a good 10 minutes before those uneven feet ended up right in front of my face. And she chased me through the pews, but I could go faster than she could. And I got out the back and ran and, and went back to CCD. That night, though, I couldn't sleep because I was thinking, how can I be part of that? That thing, that collaboration, that thing that was happening in my sanctuary, how could I be there? And I devised a plan. The next night, I rode my bike up to the church, and I went in the back, and in a Catholic church, there are confessionals in the back. And the priest's confessional has a window in it. And so I went into the priest's confessional, and I was just too short to see out the little window. So I stood on the chair, 
and I looked out the window. What I didn't know is when you put pressure on the chair, a light goes on over the confessional that says the priest is there and ready to take confession. <laughs> now, the story would be better if, in fact, somebody came in to be absolved of their sins, but that didn't actually happen. I was able to watch the rehearsal for a good long time, and I kept my eye on that stage manager, and she was nowhere to be found, but eventually I couldn't see somebody was standing in front of the window. And the door opened, and it was James Thornton, this director. And he was in his early 30s, crazy auburn hair, an auburn beard, and he said, what are you doing here? And I quickly pretended to pray. <laughs> and I said, I just want to be part of this. And he reached his hand out, and he shook my hand. And he shook it like he meant it, not like people shake a 14-year-old's hand where they're being cute and it's kind of, isn't that nice, that little boy shaking a hand? And he said, there are rules and you'll have to follow them. And he meant it. And he gave a series of rules. I'm going to share three of them today. The first rule was this. You have to show up. And that seems so obvious. I think it was Woody Allen who said 90% of genius is just showing up. But what he meant is you have to live a lifestyle that allows you to make it to rehearsal, to make it to performance, to show up for what matters. And that choice we see is a really difficult one. The wonderful Angela Lansbury just closed a little night music on Broadway. She never missed a performance. In her 80s, she always shows up. He also meant that we had to show up in terms of being there now. That we couldn't be thinking about yesterday or what was to come, or, and we didn't have the cell phones then, but today the kids on their cell phones. We had to be in the room because our enterprise was a creative one, it was a community one, and it was collaborative. And what we do together requires everybody being in the room at the same time. Number two, he said, do your best. And that has resonated for me. Perfectionism is the death of creativity. You have to allow yourself a little room to just do your best today. It makes me think of the Leonard Cohen lyric, ring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering. There's a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. James was directing uh, The Fantastics, and it was a show that had traveled around before I became part of it, and I was becoming the mute in this particular production. Everyone had done the show before except for me. We were moving into a reclaimed railroad station. The reclamation took so long that I didn't get to rehearse this role. I got to do the first act, and the mute basically follows the lead character around, and when he throws something, you catch it. So James just kept saying to me, don't worry, just follow me around. I'll throw something, you catch it. I said, I'm pretty good at catching things. So we're there, it's the preview. I'm standing in the wings, right behind him, ready to go. And he turns around and looks at me, and he says, you can't wear your glasses on stage. And he takes my glasses off, puts them in his pocket, and makes his entrance. <laughs> and blind, I have to do the fantastics. And in the first number, I walk by him and I say, I can't see anything. And he says, do your best. <laughs> I love the idea of do your best because it leaves room for imperfection. One of my other incredible teachers was the playwright Arthur Miller. And he was talking about being in Washington uh, for the House of Un-American Activities. And uh, I said, were, were you terrified? And he said, no, there is no fear when you're just doing your best. And I love that. The third thing James brought to me that was invaluable was to leave the place better than you found it. And he meant that literally for us. We would go into a, a house and do a show and leave an improvement. But he also meant that when we did a show in a town, that we raised the spirit of that town, that we examined what it was to be a human being and hopefully left the world a little better for that investigation. It makes me think of a playwright, Stephen Svoboda, who was once my student and is now my teacher. He took a group of artists to Tanzania and they were to work in an AIDS orphanage, and the first thing they had to do was bring some children from a mom who was very sick to the orphanage. 
so that they could get used to being there while she was still alive. The next morning, she showed up at his door and said, I understand that you are a writer. And he said, yes. And she said, will you tell my story so that my children know who we were and that there was love? And I think when we are at our best, that's what we do in the theater. We tell our crazy human story. It's complicated. Sometimes it's offensive. Sometimes it's confusing. But at the end, what we give the next generation is the message of who we were and that there was love. And so there I was sitting in that hospice, telling this story to the hospice worker. And she said, so did he? I said, did did he what? And she said, did he leave the world better than he found it? And I said, yes, yes, he did. And somewhere from the depths of wherever his spirit was, his hand came up. And I shook his hand because I meant it. Thank you.